Hi, and welcome to our presentation, Lessons Learned During the Iterative Development of a National Transmedia Family Program. This showcase is a collaboration between Twin Cities Public Television and Rockman et al. Cooperative. In this showcase, we introduce the iterative formative research conducted during the development of a transmedia technology-based program for five to eight-year-olds and their parents and caregivers. We highlight three key lessons learned or relearned about making digital content accessible intergenerationally, integrating digital and hands-on activities post-COVID, fostering intra and inter family engagement, and extending learning beyond the program space. First, we'd like to share a little background about our project to give you some context for what we'll be talking about. Skillsville is a transmedia project funded through a ready to learn grant from the US Department of Education. Skillsville includes three programs that each highlight three curricular pillars, career exposure, executive function skills, and self-regulation strategies. We teach executive function skills as the skills that we depend on every day to help us learn, work, and manage daily activities. In Skillsville, these are named with child-friendly terms like focus, organize, or think differently. We also teach about self-regulation strategies as tools and techniques that support executive functioning during difficult everyday situations. And finally, we introduce children to a wide variety of careers and how executive function skills are the foundation for success no matter what they choose to do in life. Here, we will specifically be talking about the family program. The Skillsville Family Program is designed as a series of four sessions where caregivers and their five to eight-year-old children engage in hands-on and digital activities together. Each week focuses on one executive function skill and includes a TV episode, a paper-based game, a tablet-based game, and self-regulation strategies. So far, we've completed three rounds of research and evaluation for the family program, and we're currently wrapping up the fourth round. The first round of research was a national needs assessment, which we carried out in the summer and fall of 2021. The needs assessment was conducted with caregivers of five to eight year olds, and our purpose was to understand which executive function skills caregivers viewed as most important to their children's success, how they supported children's use of self-regulation strategies, and how they approached career exposure with their young children. In total, 686 caregivers participated in an online survey, 30 spoke with us via individual interviews, and 27 joined us in focus groups. Next, we ran an alpha version of the program in the summer of 2022. One Southern community organization ran this one night event with seven families and one educator. Research included observations, activity feedback forms, and follow-up interviews with both the educator and the families. From here, we revised the program's content and structure before running a beta version of the program in February of 2023. This time we expanded the program to two sessions. 21 families participated through a Midwestern Community Education site and research included observations, caregiver and child focus groups, activity feedback forms, and interviews with 12 families, three facilitators, and the site coordinator. In the fourth round, which we're just wrapping up, three organizations across the country have implemented the program as a series of four weekly sessions. With this round, we're again conducting observations, collecting activity feedback forms, surveying the educators and caregivers at the end of the program, and speaking with educators and families via interviews. Through this formative work, we've identified several lessons about creating tech-infused intergenerational learning programs, and we showcase three of those takeaways here. Our first lesson is make no assumptions about digital accessibility or interest particularly in a landscape shaped by COVID. The shift to online learning and increased digital content during the COVID lockdown certainly highlighted both the affordances and constraints of online spaces and forced a lot of people to increase their digital comfort quickly. With that, it's tempting to think flippantly with ideas like, oh, everyone knows how to use a QR code now, but it's neither true that everyone is suddenly comfortable with digital content, 
nor that they're interested in it after being fairly inundated with screens. In particular, the Alpha implementation of the Skillsville Family Program emphasized the multiple challenges that can arise with technology-based family programming. For example, during the Alpha, it was difficult for caregivers to follow a multi-step login process, which required them to scan a QR code with their phones, create a caregiver account, navigate to their email to retrieve a login code, return to the website to complete the login and generate an account for their children, and then scan a new QR code with a tablet for their children to finally access the program content. This multi-step, multi-device process was especially taxing with a slow internet connection and limited time for the program. All while caregivers tried to also attend their young children who were growing restless while waiting. Although staff were present to assist with the process, there were not enough staff to go around. Therefore, a key takeaway was that we needed to simplify the login process to be more accessible. Especially important here is that our program is meant to be intergenerational, meaning that we want the program to be accessible to grandparents or older caregivers as well. If millennial caregivers were having difficulty accessing our content, we knew we had work to do. Based on this first lesson, we simplified the login process. We pre-generated individualized QR codes for families, which logged families directly into the platform. And this allowed them to skip the process of creating accounts during the first session and get right to the content. Instead, at the end of the program, families now received printed instructions for creating accounts on their own time if they'd like to continue to access the digital content after the program ends. We also revised these instructions based on points of confusion or suggestions that arose during separate formative testing. Here, we were able to streamline the login process so that accessing the content itself did not pose a barrier to intergenerational learning and engagement. For older caregivers, most children are now able to get on to the platform on their own because they have greater comfort scanning QR codes. Our second lesson is lean into content that lends itself to intergenerational, whole group, and interfamily engagement. Across each phase of our research development, caregivers have had clear preferences in content type. They've appreciated the digital content because it's educational and designed to encourage co-engagement in a way that allows them to witness their children's learning in a different way than everyday screen use. But overall, they've preferred to also engage in hands-on activities, especially following the influx of screen time that they've experienced since COVID. Caregivers have consistently requested more hands-on content. In part, caregivers felt that the hands-on activities provided opportunities to engage both within their families and with other families. During the beta and pilot phases of the program, each session began with a shared family meal. At each table, there were conversation cards. These were sets of questions that caregivers could ask children during the meal and used to connect with other families. For example, what is something you did today that made you proud? One participant told us they were a different way to engage than just, how was school? Fine. Another caregiver agreed that these questions were different than what she normally asked her children and noted that she planned to incorporate the prompts outside of the program with other members of her family. She said, I'm always asking questions about school or what they want to eat, and it's always um, the questions parents have to ask. It was something that I could ask and it was important and I had to think about it as well. We're having a family time every month and I'll be sharing that with my sister and her children just to get the icebreaker. Caregivers communicated a sense that they were participating in family programming in order to have more opportunity to engage in conversations like this, conversations that allowed them to connect with their families and with others to foster community. Although caregivers valued joint screen engagement and appreciated the opportunity to better understand how meaningful learning happens through digital content, they felt that the most meaningful connections happened when digital content didn't take center stage. So those connections are supported by a symbiotic relationship between digital and non-digital content in which non-digital content allows families to extend conversations, deepen understanding of curricular goals, and connect learning across the program. One educator summarized this idea saying, the value of giving families a space to just play together for a couple hours, I think can't really be understated. Like just watching them do the breathing exercises together or figure out the paper games together, I just think that my takeaway there is that it's such a valuable thing to have, just like a dedicated space to do those activities together, kind of learn together, play together, figure things out together. 
This lesson told us that it was important to keep all of the analog content in our programming and that caregivers appreciated the mixture and balance of digital and hands-on activities. But it also taught us that we wanted to better scaffold interactions around our digital content for caregivers to feel supported in knowing how to engage in digital learning with their children. For example, caregivers were used to having a more passive role with their children while they engaged in screen time. We had provided both child and adult headphones and splitters so caregivers could hear the audio alongside children during digital games. But caregivers didn't naturally know what to do with the splitters and headphones without being explicitly told their purpose. We also decided to emphasize that caregivers were children's educators during their time together at the family program. And we supported them in having a more active role by adding simplified game instructions and objectives to the slides that were being projected at the front of the room so caregivers could refer back to them as they played together. Along with these directions, we added a set of questions that caregivers could ask their children while they were playing digital games in order to encourage co-engagement, support caregivers in the type of engagement that was newer to most, and to build caregivers' own understanding of the program's learning goals and process. Our third lesson is scaffold learning beyond the program site by intentionally integrating content across learning spaces. During the beta of the program, families received content to take with them and do on their own between on-site sessions. This included a copy of the paper-based game that they had played together at the first session, and families shared that they did indeed play this game called Inspect and Sketch, pictured here, again after the program. As one caregiver shared, she liked it so much that she, shot, she taught her siblings when we got home. And then we did it for an activity as a family. Here the child was already familiar with the game and she initiated an extended and connected learning opportunity with her family at home. But when families left the first session, they also received content that was new to them and they felt less comfortable engaging with that content outside of the program space. For example, they received a sheet of daily prompts about the skills and strategies that they were learning about. Caregivers appreciated the idea of these prompts, but they wanted more explicit guidance about how to integrate them into their daily routines and how to connect it back to other program content. Similarly, in her interview, the pro a program facilitator suggested that content like this should be introduced at the end of one session, and when they reconvene at the next session, the whole group should start with a reflection on these materials. Insights like these allow us to see which content was already well scaffolded and which content needed further support in order to truly foster connected learning opportunities and not assume that connections are clear to participants. It might sound obvious, but when you're down in the weeds of everyday program development, it's easy to forget how to make these connections explicit or to allow meaningful time for families to familiarize themselves with the content and its goals, as well as to reflect on it. This can make the difference between a program that supports connected learning in theory and one that fosters it in practice. Based on this lesson, we've added introductions to takeaway materials in each session so that families understand the purpose of the content that they're receiving and how it relates to the activities they've already done together at the program site. We've also followed organizations' creative lead in adding reminders that may even be tangible. For example, during the first week of the program, families learned about different kinds of breathing strategies that they could use, including that they could imagine blowing petals off a flower. One organization decided to use some of their program stipend to buy pinwheels and artificial flowers for fam each family. These objects served as a physical, visual reminder for families to use their breathing strategies throughout the week. And we heard from caregivers that they used the flowers and pinwheels to engage in the strategy on their own and with their children. For example, one caregiver said, every day we breathe. We have our flower, they're in the car. So when I pick them up from summer camp, we all take a moment because we're all in the car. Before we go into camp and before I drop them off, we breathe. Another caregiver shared, I'm able to remember that the first thing to focus is inhaling and exhaling. And it was really good practice for me because I started doing it in my daily life and I was like, I got it. I got it from the facilitator, you know, blowing out, blowing and inhaling on that flower, you know, and I even keep the flower on my counter. Families strategically place their flowers and pinwheels in common spaces in their daily lives as reminders to practice and apply the lessons from the program. These objects traveled with them from the program space to their other everyday spaces 
serving as a bridge between them and encouraging them to connect their learning and even extend it with other family members. As one member, mother shared, her daughter now offers to go get the flower when her younger brother is struggling. Through our multi-phase development process, we have gathered important lessons for creating meaningful digital-based educational programming. These lessons are crucial to fostering learning environments that are intergenerational, not just in name, but also in practice. Importantly, executive function skills and self-regulation strategies travel with children and their families as they navigate their communities, at school, running errands, and on the playground. The iterative design process also challenges us as content creators and researchers to employ the very skills that we aim to teach. For example, we are held accountable to thinking flexibly about our approaches as we listen to families' experiences and adapt the program accordingly. As we continue to learn from families, we're currently implementing the four-week version of our program with the remaining two organizations. What we find out in this phase will allow us to further adapt the family program to provide the kinds of tech-infused learning opportunities that families and educators envision and find meaningful. As we do so, we take the words of one child participant as our motto. I learned I can do more things than my first idea that pops in my head. Thank you for listening, and we'd love to hear from you. Please reach out to me, Bryce Becker, at bbecker at tpt.org. Bye for now.